Hello and welcome to another TLDR Explains video. With phase 4 of the government's economic stimulus package being debated in Congress, and with its $3 trillion price tag, we thought now would be a good time to explain exactly how laws are made in the United States. Sometimes it's difficult to understand why Congress can't get more done, so in this video we're going to take a look at the system of government in the US, how laws are made, and how they can be challenged and overturned. If you are interested specifically in that $3 trillion stimulus package, then you can check out the video we made on the topic, where we explain what's in the package, as well as how likely it is to actually make it through Congress. There's a link to that video in the description. First off, let's establish that most democracies around the world have three basic and distinct branches of government, legislative, executive, and judicial, though the way they manifest themselves can vary depending on country. Unlike the UK, which has an uncodified constitution, the US has a codified constitution, meaning that the entire constitution can be found in one document. In the US, the three branches of government are outlined in Articles 1, 2, and 3 of the United States Constitution. So, let's go through each branch individually. Article 1 of the Constitution lays out the legislative branch. Like the UK, the US is a Republican democracy, meaning that people elect representatives to make laws for them. In the US, there are two bodies that are involved in the making of law, the House of Representatives and the Senate, which together make up the United States Congress. The Constitution also lays out the requirements of membership of these houses, such as age, 25 for the House and 30 for the Senate, and residency requirements. It also spells out exactly what they can and cannot do. For example, Article 1, Section 8 sets out the powers specifically designated to Congress, such as taxation, providing for the armed forces, and the declaration of war, while Section 9 sets out powers specifically denied to Congress, such as export taxes and titles of nobility. Section 8, Clause 18, however, is a clause designed to give Congress the necessary flexibility required to make laws. This is usually referred to as the Necessary and Proper, or Elastic Clause. It gives Congress the power to make laws that are necessary and proper for carrying into execution the powers given to Congress. Article 2 invests the powers of the executive branch in an indirectly elected president, who has many duties, but his primary function is to execute the laws as they are passed by Congress. I say indirectly because while the direct popular vote is considered, the president is actually elected by the Electoral College. We won't go into that now, but if you'd like to see a video on how the Electoral College works, particularly with this election year heating up, let us know by liking this video and commenting down below. Anyway, the president serves as the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, determines the country's foreign policy, and has authority to veto laws passed by Congress. As with Article 1 and Congress, Article 2 lays out the qualifications for President and Vice President. They must be at least 35 years of age, they must have been a resident for 14 years, and a natural-born citizen of the United States. The age of 35 and resident for 14 years are pretty straightforward, but what does it mean to be a natural-born citizen? Well, this term has only become very important in modern times, with former candidates for president like Ted Cruz, who was born in Canada, and John McCain, who was born in the Panama Canal Zone. While the Supreme Court has never actually ruled on this question, the phrase is usually interpreted as a citizen at time of birth. Article 3 deals with the judicial branch. While the Constitution doesn't establish a court system, and leaves the Congress to do so, it does establish one court, the US Supreme Court. As the name might suggest, the US Supreme Court is the highest court in the country, and consists of nine justices, who are appointed by the President at the time, and are subject to the confirmation of the US Senate. More on the court in a bit though. In the US, there is also a fourth branch of government, that while not laid out in the Constitution, has evolved over the country's 244 year history. This branch is referred to as the bureaucracy. Congress has organised departments to handle the everyday business of federal government, 
Each department has a secretary that heads up the department, and collectively, they make up the president's cabinet, a group of advisors to the president that help carry out his agenda. And like the justices of the Supreme Court, these secretaries are appointed by the president and then are subject to confirmation in the Senate. We don't have time to go into all of the different departments, but let's just give an example or two. The Secretary of State is the head of the State Department, which carries out US foreign policy at the direction of the President. This gets a bit complicated, because it means that with a new President comes a whole new foreign policy. An example would be President Obama's approach to Iran throughout the now infamous Iran nuclear deal. Once President Trump took office, he pulled the US out of the deal and fundamentally changed US-Iranian diplomacy, much to the chagrin of many Democrats. Another department organised by Congress is the Defence Department. As you might have guessed, the Defence Department is responsible for organising the country's security and defence. If you'd like to know more about US bureaucracy, let us know by liking this video and commenting down below. So, how do these branches work together to turn a bill into a law? Well, bills can be proposed in either House of Congress. However, certain laws must originate in specific chambers. Spending laws, for example, must originate in the House of Representatives, as it's considered the People's House. Regardless of where it begins, there are three steps that a bill must go through in each House. Proposal, Committee and Floor. Members of Congress propose legislation by drafting bills and submitting them to their individual House of Congress. The bill is then referred to the proper committee, and this is where most bills die. Committees have hearings, make amendments and vote on the bill. By the end of the committee process, most bills are very different from how they begin. If the bill is still alive after making it through the committee stage, it then proceeds to the full chamber where it's debated and voted upon. It's worth noting here that bills do not have to have a positive vote result from the committee stage in order to proceed to the floor, although progressing without the approval of committee is a rare occurrence. If the bill clears the vote of the full House or Senate, it then proceeds to the other chamber of Congress for the same committee and vote process. If the second chamber changes the bill in any way, it then has to go back to the first House for another vote. If the two houses cannot come to an agreement, the bill is sent to the conference committee, made up of members of both political parties and both houses, until they come up with a version of the bill that satisfies both sides. Ultimately, a bill cannot move on in the process if a single letter is different in the two chambers' versions of the bill. By this point, it's entirely possible that the bill has died completely, and it's worth noting that most bills don't make it this far. However, if a bill has made it, it then goes to the President of the United States. They have three options at their disposal. They can sign it, not sign it, or veto it. If the President signs it, then the bill becomes law. If the President vetoes it, then it goes back to Congress, who have the opportunity to override the President's veto with a two-thirds supermajority in each House. In practice, most bills never make it this far, and the threat of a veto is usually enough to dissuade Congress from sending a bill to the President. It's also worth noting here that vetoes are very rarely overridden. To give you an idea, there have been 2,580 vetoes in the country's history. Only 111 have been overridden. Anyway, if the President doesn't sign the bill and doesn't veto it within 10 days, the bill becomes law. But if, and only if, Congress is still in session. If during that 10 day period, however, Congress adjourns, then the bill fails to become law and is referred to as a pocket veto. In this case, the bill dies either way. As you can see, there are so many ways for a bill to die and so many stages that can end up killing the bill that it's actually more unlikely that a bill will become law. However, if it does make it through this process and become law, it's not a certainty that it will stay that way. Obviously, aside from Congress having the ability to change the law using the same process we just outlined, courts also can play a role thanks to the principle of judicial review. In 1803, in the Supreme Court case of Marbury v. Madison, then-Justice John Marshall borrowed the theory, which states that courts have the right to examine the constitutionality of laws. That is, whether the laws are in agreement with and abide with the Constitution. 
According to Article 6, Section 1, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and as such, laws that are passed by Congress or the states cannot conflict with the Constitution. There are three things worth noting here. 1. The Constitution itself never mentions judicial review, nor does it grant the court any authority of judicial review. However, Marshall borrowed the theory from the Judiciary Act of 1789, which did give federal courts the power of judicial review with regards to the decisions of state courts, so in a way they already had the authority. This ruling just expanded it to include acts of Congress. 2. Only Supreme Court decisions can overturn another Supreme Court decision, and as such, the landmark Marbury case has never been overturned. And three, the courts do not automatically examine and review the constitutionality of all laws. The courts only review laws when they're challenged by someone. While the courts have exercised this power on a number of occasions, it's worth noting that generally courts have done so rarely. As we mentioned before, the Constitution did not establish a court system and left it to Congress to do so. In his opinion, Marshall said, if two laws conflict with each other, the courts must decide on the operation of each. If then the courts are to regard the Constitution, and the Constitution is superior to any act of the legislature, then the Constitution, and not such ordinary act, must govern the case to which they both apply. Basically, the Constitution is the highest law in the country, and as such, no other laws can conflict with it. And when a law does conflict with the Constitution, the courts and the interpreters of the law have the right to strike it down. As you can see, the process of passing a law in the US is complicated to say the least, and with so many steps in the process, it's easy to see why getting laws passed is a complicated process. The framers wanted a constitution that not only divided power between the separate branches, but also put checks in place to keep any branch from gaining too much authority. And certainly, when the different branches are controlled by different political parties who have different priorities, it's sometimes difficult to get them to agree to anything. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more videos like it, then let us know in the comments which topics you'd like us to discuss. If you're interested in political systems, you might also enjoy the TLDR UK video where we discuss how laws are passed in the UK, or our video from TLDR EU where we discuss how the European Union gets things done. There's links to both videos in the description. Thanks for watching and be sure to subscribe to the channel and also click the bell icon to be notified whenever we release a new video. If you want to find more from us across all social networks, simply search for TLDR News. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible.